Neurology in Primary Care, developed by Templeton Institute for Neurology. Templeton Institute for Neurology is a comprehensive neurology practice dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of neurologic disease. We are located in San Luis Obispo, with a satellite office in North County. Our Neurology Second Opinion Clinic in San Francisco is held once a month. We apply the same excellent standards we use assessing patients who see us for an initial consult to the patients who see us for a second or third opinion. This is why our success rate is more than 38% in changing diagnosis or treatment when we do a Neurology Second Opinion. We do not promise miracles but we frequently change quality of life. This review, even though it is comprehensive, should not be used as the sole source for physicians when they are making decisions regarding treatment of their patients. The Dilemma of Subclinical Hypothyroidism in Primary Care Practice, Part 1 In today's episode, we will address three questions. One, what is subclinical hypothyroidism? Two, which conditions which could mimic subclinical hypothyroidism? Three, what do I do? In future episodes, we will address the questions, when to treat subclinical hypothyroidism, neurologic issues related to subclinical hypothyroidism, and how we approach them at Templeton Institute for Neurology. Subclinical hypothyroidism is defined as a normal T4 in the presence of an elevated TSH. It is estimated that subclinical hypothyroidism ranges from 4 to 15%. The percentage is in the higher range in older population. Subclinical hypothyroidism tends to be higher in females and somewhat higher in whites compared to blacks. Even though elevated TSH with normal T4 sounds more like a laboratory definition, subclinical hypothyroidism may occur in the presence or absence of mild symptoms of hypothyroidism. Most patients will have serum TSH levels, 10 asymptomatic. Most laboratories have the upper normal for TSH value at 4 to 5. So you may belong to one of two categories of physicians, those who believe that a value above 2.5 to 3 is the upper limit for normal in a healthy patient, and those who subscribe to TSH values above 4 to 5 as their threshold to call it abnormal or elevated. At Templeton Institute for Neurology, we answer this very controversial upper range of normal by applying a road map. 1. Does the patient have positive anti-TPO antibodies? 2. Does the range of TSH reflect patient age? 3. Did the patient's thyroid suffer a previous insult, like partial thyroidectomy, radiation to the neck area, or goiter treatment? 4. Has the TSH been confirmed elevated with a repeat test three months following the original one? 5. How does the current TSH value compare to a few years back value, if available? 6. Is T4 in the very low range of normal? 7. Is the patient symptomatic? This road map leaves room for each one of you to apply their own bias. After all, medicine is an art. Of course, for us, we have one more item we add to this road map. What type of neurologic findings does the patient have? When patients have symptoms, they may have fatigue, constipation, dry skin, difficulty with memory, difficulty with concentration, weight gain, lack of energy, depression, or more obvious overt hypothyroidism like complaints. Let us dig a little deeper into some of the questions on this roadmap. Has the TSH level been confirmed with a repeated test? <laughs> At Templeton Institute for Neurology, we usually repeat the TSH in three months. This helps with correcting for assay variability. Overall, we believe a longer period will help account for the occasional transient elevations in TSH. 
in healthy individuals, which may happen following an acute illness not related to the thyroid. The acute illness may produce transient suppression of TSH, followed by transient elevation following recovery. When assessing the TSH roadmap, it is also important to consider the following much less common factors which could affect TSH and lead to elevated readings. 1. The presence of rheumatoid factor. 2. TSH antibodies, which lead to forming a complex of TSH and TSH antibodies, which is not biologically effective but could be immune reactive, hence leading to false measurements of TSH. These are usually 100. 3. Untreated adrenal insufficiency. 4. Pituitary adenomas, which produce TSH. 5. Resistance to thyroid hormone due to changes in the TSH receptors. 6. Central hypothyroidism, as 25% of patients with central hypothyroidism may have mild elevated TSH levels. Who gets treated? The question is so simple to answer when TSH equals 10. The consensus is to treat, but it is not so easy when TSH values are 4.5 to 10. It is made simpler for any physicians to take action in this controversial level of TSH. If anti-TPO antibodies were detected, indicating the diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis in a young female complaining of fatigue and some weight gain. But as many of the practicing physicians would know that the benefits cultivated are frequently not as rewarding as we hope to, possibly because many of the complaints are related to an autoimmune process rather than hypothyroidism per se. Having a goiter and TSH level in the range of 4.5 to 10 may also tip the scale toward imitating therapy with thyroxine early. Having a patient older than 70 and a possible coronary artery disease or arrhythmia may tip the scale toward being more cautious initiating therapy. Further considerations to help make a decision to treat or not to treat in subclinical hypothyroidism could be given to some of the following published studies. A study from Denmark from the endocrine unit of the Bispepjerg Hospital Copenhagen, published in 2005, showed that the modest increase in body weight was observed with upper range of normal for TSH. This modest six-letter word is living example for what we call the devil is in the details. Indeed, the difference of body weight between those in the lower range of normal and the upper range of normal for TSH was 5.5 kilograms among women, according to the paper. This is 12 pounds extra for the women in the upper range of normal for TSH. There was association between higher levels of T4 and less extra weight, but there was no association between T3 and weight differences. In all, 4,649 participants were investigated and 4,082 were eligible for these analyses after exclusion of subjects with previous or present overt thyroid dysfunction. I suspect that it is possible at this point for some of you who take care of middle-aged women in Orange County have made up their mind about their roadmap for subclinical hypothyroidism. This may be reaching to the pause button as we speak. Please do not press the pause button yet. There is more to come after this short break. I welcome you back, those of you who are still listening. 
the authors have concluded in their own words, and I quote, our results suggest that thyroid function, also within the normal range, could be one of several factors acting in concert to determine body weight in a population. So we think that this study could be used as part of the roadmap and should not be overinterpreted when trying to make a decision about initiating therapy. Further published studies will present conflicting findings when addressing subclinical hypothyroidism and coronary artery disease. There has been also some indication that there is more prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism in patients with unprovoked DVT, as well as among patients with common bile duct stones. These studies again are small, but they float there in the medical literature. We are going to discuss neurologic issues in the setting of subclinical hypothyroidism in a future podcast. Finally, we would like you to have one more pearl before we conclude today's episode. During the process of titrating thyroxine dose, the patient TSH may not drop as expectedly in those who are taking medications that decrease T4 absorption. 1. Cholesteramine, cholestipol, cholesevlam, aluminium hydroxide, calcium carbonate, sucralfate, iron sulfate, relaxifem known as Ivista, ombrazole and lansoprazole, sevlema and lanthamine carbonate used in chronic renal failure patients, chromium. This list is to be considered again when one of these medications is added to a patient on a stable dose of thyroxine who starts to complain of mild weight gain, constipation, dry skin, fatigue, lack of energy or mild depression. This concludes our episode for today. Thank you for listening to this episode of Neurology in Primary Care by Templeton Institute for Neurology. For comments or if you would like to be a contributing author to our podcast, please email us at Templeton Neurology at gmail.com This episode was made possible by the generous contribution of Templeton Institute for Neurology. Templeton Institute for Neurology is a comprehensive neurology practice dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of neurologic disease. We are located in San Luis Obispo with a satellite office in North County. Our Neurology Second Opinion Clinic in San Francisco is held once a month. We apply the same excellent standards we use to assess patients who see us for an initial consult to the patients who see us for a second or third opinion. This is why our success rate is more than 38% changing diagnosis or treatment when we do a neurology second opinion. We do not promise miracles but we frequently change quality of life. This review, even though it's comprehensive, should not be used as the sole source for physicians when they are making decisions regarding treatment of their patients.